All right. Um, I think I think we're on air now, so um, we should be ready to start, shall we? Yes. Super. Hello and welcome, everyone. My name is um, Jakob Freund, and um, I'm happy to welcome you to our Commander BPM 7.5 release webinar. And what I will do right away is share my screen in order to introduce ourselves. So, there we go. Okay, so who's with me here today? <laughs> um, Daniel. Daniel is um, technical lead of Commander BPM, but maybe, um, Daniel, could you just quickly introduce yourself, maybe? Yes, I'm Daniel. I'm the technical lead of Kumuna BPM. I'm happy to be here today. I've um, yeah, been there since the beginning with Kumuna BPM, and this is now um, our fifth release in, in Kumuna. And um, it's still packed with really amazing features, and the team has done a great um, effort in, in delivering that. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here and um, tell, tell the users about it. Thanks, Daniel. And uh, right next to Daniel is uh, Nico. Nico, who are you? Yeah, hello. Um, thanks for hosting me. Um, I'm Nico. I'm um, technical, uh, technically responsible for the for the modeling tools we have. Recently, like uh, half a year ago, we started a new generation of modeling tools, like a standalone modeler. We with BPM NIO, we're building a lot of um, like also modeling tools that you can easily embed into your application and customize for your your needs. And that's what I'm responsible for. And I'm happy to answer your questions today. Great, thank you, Nico. Yes, so um, it's Daniel and Nico and, and myself, Jacob, and the idea is to um, let you know what, what we have done um, with Camunda BPM 7.5 to give you an update about the new features, um, et cetera, and of course, this will be um, partly um, a presentation with slides, but mostly it's gonna be um, some live demos. As always, um, you will find the material that um, I'm presenting now on SlideShare afterwards, um, as well as the recording of this webinar. So there will be some, some links going around um, um, once we have finished this, this webinar today. And if you have any questions, please um, feel free to ask them in the chat window on the left-hand side. Um, then and Nico will probably be able to answer most of those um, um, right away. Um, however, in some cases, it may make sense to um, uh, gather them, collect them, and answer them at, at the end of the webinar. Yeah, so nothing really really special here. That's how it works. And uh, I would say let's look at um, Camunda right away. So for those of you who are new to Camunda BPM, and there's always some who are not that familiar with the product already, just in a nutshell what it is about. Um, BPM stands for Business Process Management. Camunda BPM is obviously a software platform. It's open source, and it's um, about BPM and specifically, or BPM specifically about three standards. Um, one is called BPM 2.0, um, well-known standard for um, describing and executing structured workflows, business processes. Um, second standard um, from the object management group as well called CMMN. C stands for case, so this is obviously about case management, and you could also call it um, less structured activities, um, and it's about DMN. Um, yeah, once again, um, from OMG, um, a standard which is all about decisions. So um, as you can see, you can use Camunda to graphically model and technically execute all three standards in order to approach BPM in a very holistic way. Yeah, who's using that kind of technology? Um, here's some representative um, 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 reference customers. So Allianz, for example, um, representing all those insurance companies using Camunda, um, the, the DIB bank. Um, so this is about the finance industry, obviously. Um, the German Rail, um, National Rail is using Camunda. So logistics and transport is a very common industry to leverage Camunda BPM. Uh, T-Mobile, um, in this case, specifically T-Mobile in Austria, executing orders. And um, Zalando, um, which is, uh, yeah, probably the most valuable uh, startup in, in Europe. Um, they're all about uh, fashion, they sell fashion online, and um, they execute all orders that come in worldwide using Camunda BPM. So Zalando, in a way, stands for every company um, that leverages IT as a core element of their business model, even though they are not an IT company in, in the first place. 
Um, I'm assuming that some of you are um, in the United States, so it may be interesting to know that also AT&T is um, using Camunda, um, and FINRA is using Camunda, Sony Media is, is using it, and, and many other customers in North America as well. So um, therefore, although we are originally from Berlin and Germany, you may have recognized our accents already, um, it's, it's really a, a product that is um, yeah, spreading globally, basically. Okay, so, so much about Camunda itself. So let's look at the newest version. And um, one thing I'm always very proud of is that we are very um, yeah, disciplined in a way um, in terms of, of the release cycle. So we, we release Camunda every half year period. This is a time boxed um, approach. So we may not know beforehand which features will be included, but we will know for sure when it is available. And I really like that approach because it, of course, um, gives us a certain reliability um, also for our customers. And that's very helpful. So as you can see, we have released 7.3 in, in May 15, 7.4 half year later, and now 7.5 um, yesterday, actually, on the 31st of May. Um, you can expect 7.6 um, in six months from now, obviously. In 7.5, um, um, we have put um, the, the combined efforts of um, now 18 core developers, so Camunda employees working full-time um, on, on, on this technology, um, but also more than 50 external contributors helped us shaping this release. Since it's open source, that's, of course, a very common thing. And uh, we're using Jira as a ticketing system, which helps us um, managing the, the the bug reports as well as the feature requests, and we have, yeah, once again, um, an all-time high in terms of the number of Jira tickets that we have um, been able to successfully close for this release. So that's what we've put into it. Um, now what um, will you get out of it? Um, there's, of course, many improvements, um, many minor features that we have implemented, uh, but we have um, yeah, summarized um, 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 the highlights here. So in the very first chapter of today's webinar, we will look at, at modeling, the part that Nico is representing today. Um, specifically, we were looking at uh, the fact that you can now graphically uh, design CMN models, so you can not only execute them, but also um, model them. And we have a very interesting um, new feature set, which we call element templates that, yeah, I will explain and, and, and demo in a few minutes. Um, after that, we will look at the process instance migration, which is one of the major improvements of, of Camunda BPM when it comes to execution. So um, many of you, um, I'm assuming, are already aware of, of the underlying problem uh, that is being solved by, by this new um, feature set. And uh, then we will look at uh, so-called resource-efficient multi-tenancy. This is specifically interesting if you are with an ISV, an independent software vendor, um, who wants to leverage Camunda um, as as part of, of their product, especially if you want to operate it in the cloud in a software as a service fashion. We have um, um, added some new features to the REST API, which are specifically about reports, and we have created a duration report. You could also call it a cycle time report um, for process instances and cockpit that we can quickly look at. And we have um, already in 7.4 implemented a very interesting pattern that we call the external task pattern. Um, and that pattern has seen a very um, very high adoption rate in the last six months, uh, way higher than, than we anticipated ourselves, or at least I personally. So we have improved the support for that pattern, and um, I want to explain it a bit because um, it, it's a very interesting thing, so I think it's worth the time to look at that pattern once again. Okay, so let's, let's do it. Let's look at the modeling side of things. Um, in case you don't know it already, there's a project called uh, BPMN.io. That, that's also um, um, yeah, the name for, for, for the team of, of guys working on that, um, that Nico is responsible for. And um, so that project is open source. It consists of many different components and libraries that you can leverage yourself. We leveraged it, uh, besides other things, to uh, create something we call the Camunda Modeler which is a desktop application that you can download for the operating system of um, like Cloud Choice. And it allows you to model all three standards now um, um, that, that come from ONG, which are about BPM. You can just download it there for free and um, yeah, just go for it and try it out yourself. We are going to look at, at improvements um, that have happened now. So um, as I mentioned already, CMMN is now supported. Um, being straightforward about that, I want to point out that we are still working on completing the CMN support um, in the sense that everything is there that is, that is 
necessary for the different um, situations where you want to leverage it, especially in, in the execution environment. So it's uh, the symbol set is more or less complete. There's um, some symbols still missing. Those will be added um, in the next weeks, as well as um, the ability to um, define the technical properties, etc. So just to make sure that you're not disappointed when you try it out, um, um, it's, it's there, but it's not completely there, but very soon it's going to be there completely. Um, let me look at the element templates. So I'm just skipping that for now. Um, besides that, we have improved the modeling convenience a lot for BPMN, which is one of the absolute yeah, major focus points um, for, for Nico's team. So this is all about making BPMN modeling <laughs> sarcastically speaking, as painless as possible in order to, um, to, to help supporting and, and, and spreading it. Um, to, to phrase it in a more optimistic way, BPMN is great fun from my point of view, seriously, and uh, the modeler is, I would say, the most comfortable and the nicest way to leverage BPMN for yourself as well. So um, there's a lot of things that have happened here, and some of them are highlighted, like a full text search for your diagram to quickly find certain symbols, um, copy and paste feature, which is of course very handy um, to reuse certain elements that you have modeled already, um, um, stuff like you know, auto, -scrolling, auto scrolling on the canvas if the diagram um, 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 becomes too big, um, a tool that, um, that we call Global Connect tool that is especially helpful when you have very large diagrams and you want to yeah, connect two elements that are um, apart from each other, stuff like that. So um, yeah, good progress here. And um, I would like to focus on the element templates for now because that's not as self-explanatory as, as the other things. So what is it all about? Um, we have, of course, very different um, 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 types of organizations using Kamunda BPM. Um, some of them um, fall into an interesting category, um, which we call, for example, um, big organizations with central IT departments, like, for example, telecommunication providers. I've, I've, I've mentioned a few um, already. So um, in those organizations, you often find what you could call core developers um, who provide infrastructure um, solutions for other developers that you could call, for example, maybe citizen developers in other parts of the same organization. The idea is that those citizen developers um, 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 are not as familiar with certain programming languages as the core developers are, but they are closer to the business needs and the business departments, sometimes even embedded in business departments. So um, as you know, we as Camunda BPM do not believe in a general zero code or low code um, BPM approach. Um, I won't explain that once again. Feel free to ask us about that if you like. But um, basically we say, okay, we help software developers to leverage BPM. However, what those software developers within those big organizations or within software vendors, other software vendors, often do is they take the generic BPM platform, Camunda BPM, that targets software developers and create a domain-specific platform on top of that. So basically, they narrow down the use cases that you can tackle with Camunda, for example, to a specific industry or to a specific company. They narrow it down, and by narrowing it down, they make it less complicated, of course, which will eventually allow citizen developers to create and change workflows in a what people today call low-code fashion, so without the need to, you know, um, 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 create Java code, for example, or a big amount of Java code. So this is possible, you know, that's, that's something we have never denied to be possible. Um, it's all about making it domain-specific, you know, let it be Spider Systems, a very successful um, um, software company for the pharmaceutical industry, for example, let it be, um, I don't know, Cynix, a, a successful company for the telco industry, software solutions for telco um, companies. So um, very different industries, narrowing down the generic um, um, possibilities to domain specific possibilities make, makes the whole thing simpler and then it works. So this is happening already like quite often with our product. What we have done now is we have implemented a concept called element templates based on customer requests. So what is it about? Um, this is the Camunda model as you can download it right away. Um, that modeler supports BPMN, so you will have find all the symbols there. What you will not find, of course, out of the box is, for example, an email task, like, okay, I want to send an email out of my process. Um, this is not part of BPMN, and it's also not part of 
Camunda out of the box. However, that's of course quite often a requirement that you that you might have. So what you can do now with um, the new um, version of the modeler, you can define JSON files, like here on the right hand side, just a snippet really, JSON files that act as properties and that allow you to define subtypes of BPMN elements. So in this example, we solve the email task matter by saying, okay, we define a um, subtype called email task, which applies to a BPMN send task. So it will only be available as an element template in this dropdown when you drag a send task into the canvas. And then we define certain properties. So for example, we say, okay, um, this task will be technically executed by a Java class that is referred here. That Java class um, is technically referred in the PPMN XML um, via the Camunda class attribute. All of you already familiar with the concept of Java delegates and Camunda will recognize this, of course. So here we have the class and it's just there. Um, here we have um, a property called sender, which of course I need to name when I want to send out an email. So um, this will be then mapped um, to um, and the Camunda input parameter. All of you familiar with Camunda recognize that as well. It's a generic approach to kind of, you know, inject variables um, into um, um, some, some logic that is behind a BPMN element. So um, this is generic, but now it's mapped to a domain-specific thing like defining a sender. Okay, and we can also define validation constraints, so this must not be empty, for example, but there's much more possible. You know, you can define not only text elements, but also drop downs, and, and you can define regular expressions for validating um, um, input, et cetera, et cetera. You can even, I didn't point that out in here, but you can also leverage, for example, FreeMarker as a templating engine um, in order to um, allow, for example, not only dynamically populating those property um, um, files, uh, fields at runtime, but but also, you know, combining text and, and, and placeholders like in here. Um, we'll look at that in the live demo in a second. But I don't know if you have that, that fantasy, but <laughs> once, once you understand that, um, there's a lot of stuff happening in your mind, what, what this is actually good for. So just a few examples to point that out. Um, this, this approach, um, um, which then of course, you know, boils down to, to in this example, um, Java classes um, that are already there, of course not defined by citizen developers, but the core developers, the citizen developers just use it, not even being aware of the Java code behind it. So this is how it works. And this approach allows you to do a lot of things. You can define, yeah, let's call it connectors in a way. So like an email connector, like a Twitter connector, like a Salesforce connector, what, what not, you know, SAP, you're um, totally company specific legacy application that no BPM vendor will ever have a connector for out of the box. So you can simply define it and make it available um, and within the modeler. You can define certain re reusable business, lo business logic, like, like, like rules, like DMN decision tables that are there already, of course, with Camunda, but now you can make it way easier to call them from a BPMN process because you have domain specific property fields that the citizen developers just need to populate. Um, you can even define reusable task forms, you know, like for example, an approval task that always comes with a drop down which says, I don't know, um, yes, I approve, no, I don't, or uh, maybe, <laughs> and, um, um, and, and other, other elements, or I don't know, an, a form that is about um, uploading documents and reviewing those documents before you actually pass, uh, pass it on in the process. So there are a lot of stuff that you can then just um, make available to the citizen developers in order to leverage it um, um, at, at, at process design time. Yeah, pretty, pretty cool from my point of view. Um, there's more information, um, so if you want to get started with that, um, just, just go for it. Um, it's, it's all there, it's all free, so you can just um, check it out. There's an intro blog post, there's documentation, code examples, etc. What I will do for now is just quickly um, dive into a live demo and show how it works. And yes, I'm speaking very fast once again. <laughs> I have to, I have to be a bit more patient. Okay, so um, what do we have here? Um, this is the JSON file um, um, that, that you just put into the folder, you know, where your modeler um, um, is, for example. And as you can see here, I've already defined quite some so-called um, element templates. So for example, this here is that email task thing um, and, and, and the Twitter connector and, and, and whatever. I would love to show off all of that. I don't know if I have much time or enough time, but um, let's look how it works now. So I've done that already. I'm 
so to say, the core developer of my organization now. So um, let's say now I'm a um, citizen developer and I want to create a process that sends out an email, for example. How does it feel? Um, I, I just you know, drag in some, some elements here. I say, okay, um, this is a send task. So I say, all right, send email. Da, 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 da. And um, okay, I'm done here so far. So this is now a send task. Because it's a send task, here on the right-hand side, we have the drop-down element template available. So when I pick now email task, because of the JSON file, um, there's now those other property fields that I'm supposed to populate. I will just do that in a hard-coded fashion right now, just saying, okay, it's my personal email address, acting as the sender and the receiver, um, some subject. Um, yeah, maybe maybe let's let's make it dynamic right away. So here I'm um, I'm referring um, to to some placeholder, you know, um, with that with that dollar sign. So there's a variable called name that I um, I'm assuming that will exist in the process context, and I will use that to populate um, the body of the message. Um, also, I say that I want to send that out asynchronously, so that I don't need to wait as an end user until the mail server has actually acted um, and, and sent out the email. So what what else should I do now? I should make sure that that variable exists. So I will just quickly um, take the start event and use something that has been there already, even before 7.5. So I will just say, OK, there's simple form field, which is about a variable called name, type string, some label, and that's about it. This is really, you know, it's not about like complex forms, but it's very nice if you want to quickly prototype something or have simple forms, then you just define some fields and it will be generated as a form, for example, when someone starts the process. Okay, um, yeah, that should work. So let's try it out. What I'm going to do now is I will um, deploy the process using my personal favorite option, which is um, aren't. Of course, as a citizen developer, this is less likely, but that's not the problem here. So there's, of course, other ways to deploy processes. So um, don't bother about that, please. Um, and now I will quickly check um, if we're good. So I should look at cockpit. Ah, I've not yet dragged that to the presentation canvas. So here's cockpit. And quickly logging in, Cockpit is the, the monitoring application. So we can quickly look um, what's going on here. And we can see, OK, there's some processes deployed. One of them called the element templates example. This is what I've just created. So let's try out that process. And since this is a live webinar, there's always the probability that I've messed something up. So there's at least some thrilling aspect here. So I'm Jacob. That's my name. This is the form that has been generated because of the form field and the start event. I will send that out. This was fine so far. So let's quickly have a look at cockpit, if it worked as it should have worked. OK, nothing going on right now, which is a good sign. Checking the history, I can see what has happened so far. One instance has been completed successfully. This is a good sign. The email seems to. Um, um, you know, has been sent. So let's check my Outlook. Dip, 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 dip. And there we go. This is Hi Jacob, dynamically populated um, in the body with my name that I have entered at runtime. So as a citizen developer, I'm happy now. Okay, um, very quickly, because I can't help um, showing that off, um, what happens if I want to publish something on Twitter? Let's just do it very quickly. So I put in the next thing, say publish on Twitter. This is the send task. Oops, ah, sorry about that. OK, and there we go. Instantly hit the wrong button. And now we say, OK, um, hey, um, what was it again? My name is on Twitter. OK, try it out once again. And I'm really provoking here something to happen, so let's see if I'm successful. OK, deploying once again. OK, checking cockpit. Quickly refreshing. Ah, once again, Got the latest version makes sense. There we go. OK, trying it out. 
All right, sec. So this time it's, I don't know, Mr. Webinar Jacob. Okay. Checking cockpit in the history in order to check if something has happened. Something has happened indeed. Looks like you know, all elements have been passed successfully. So quickly checking Twitter. And there we go. Okay, so um, I want I want to show off each and every element that I have um, created here um, at, at one time. The time is not um, enough for that. Um, but what I just quickly do is um, showing that you know, for example, if I want to let something um, um, approve, for example, um, then I can say, okay, um, this um, is a user task. User task can be, for example, an approval task. And as you can see here, um, the properties change once again. So um, it will refer to a predefined form task that comes with certain elements right away. <coughs> I'm supposed to define um, the user that is allowed to approve something. So here I have a drop down, drop down now, which makes things, of course, a bit more convenient. For example, I can pass on some text that will be displayed to the approver, and I can um, say if the variable that will be populated um, with a result should be named approved. Um, this is important because, of course, if I want to, for example, route um, based on that, oops, sorry about that, I should um, then refer to that variable, so therefore I can um, define how it should be named, things like that. Um, what else do we have in my example? Um, let me quickly think as exactly the business rule task. So what I can also say is some of you may know or recognize that um, dish example where I say, okay, based on, on certain input, I want to decide um, in a decision table which dish I'm going to serve. That's just our, our simple example um, in the tutorial, okay? And here you can see we have certain input columns like season and, and the number of guests I ex um, expect, and then we will execute that table at one time and get some result out of that. Once again, I can define um, an element template for business rule tasks, which may be dish decider and then comes directly with some input properties that I can populate, which makes life easier for the citizen developer once again. So I'm assuming you, you get the point here. It's a quite powerful concept. Um, I need to um, let it rest for now. Um, just very quickly about the modeler to um, let you know about that. I've mentioned the many convenience um, improvements that, that the guys have um, implemented. So there's stuff, for example, um, you know, when I delete an element, um, then there will be just, you know, still the arrow, so I don't have to redraw that, um, which has always been there is just inserting something in, in, in between. Um, we have the make space tool, which um, allows me to, you know, make space, but also allows me now to very conveniently reduce space, for example, and maybe one of the most powerful features here, um, we can copy paste. So we can say, okay, I want to drag, um, I want to drag a new um, diagram and I want to reuse stuff that I've um, created somewhere else. So I can simply um, paste that in here and reuse it. Much more, you know, the, the diagram search um, helping me to identify elements that um, have certain caption, stuff like that, um, but way too much to, to show it off um, all in here. Um, besides that, just very quickly to prove that it's there, I can also create CMN, as I mentioned, and um, just to be clear, it's not complete, as I said, but it's, you know, more or less complete. So therefore, um, don't hesitate to check that out as well, please. And as always, everything that I model here, um, all three standards are directly serialized in XML. So we have that fancy new XML tab here, which allows me to directly inspect the XML um, that, that is behind this, this graphical representation. There's no proprietary representation. It's all being serialized in a one-on-one -on -one fashion um, in XML right away, and that XML is completely standard compliant. So that's what we're also proud of. Um, Yes, and very serious about. All right, um, yeah, so that, that's about the modeling um, part for now. Um, before we move on, um, I just have one question uh, for Nico because people ask that quite often. So we have that, that thing called bpmn.io. I can point my browser to a website um, um, and there I will find bpmn.io. And I can try out the live demo there, which is directly in the browser. I can create bpmn in the browser directly. Then we have the Camona Modeler, which is a desktop application for download. So one question I often hear is, how is that actually, how does that fit together? And also um, one question I hear quite often is, 
Okay, guys, you have it in the browser already. Um, how about modeling in the web? How about collaborate um, in the web? Any tips for me and maybe also anything I can look forward to from your end? So, Nico, maybe you can answer that question, please. Yeah, so a number of questions. Uh, let's answer the simple question first. So, our modeling toolkits are all running in the browser. So, to make it really easy, you can just embed that stuff into any web page. And the only stuff you need is eventually you're going to need some XML. And the XML you get from anywhere, right? You can get it from a server, just do a get request from the server, get it from somewhere. And on the other hand, at the end of your modeling operation, you're gonna, you can ask PPMNJS or any of our libraries, if it's PPMN, CMMN, or DMN uh, modeling, you can ask uh, the, the library for what is the current stuff that is modeled. And as a result, again, you get the, the XML string. And the XML string, that's basically the stuff that the engine understands as well. That's like standards compliant and defined by the OMG. So um, if you would like to build your own web model around it, you, you add the library to, your, to a web page and make sure you have the repository behind it. You choose your backend technology, you choose your way to store the stuff. Maybe you have got some kind of user management. Maybe you have some kind of like, this user can only um, see this kind of diagram. Maybe you have versioning, like next time you, you download it, edit it something and save it back. It's got some new version. So basically it's, um, we provide the toolkits for the modeling perspective and everything else you can basically build your custom, um, so to say, web model or repository around. What we did with the Camunda modeler, with the stuff Jacob just demoed, is um, we're using modern technologies to basically uh, um, use the, the, the web-based technology to package that into an offline application. And with the offline application, obviously, you get a number of really interesting things, like you get file system associations on Windows and on Mac OS. So just double-clicking any MPMN file, and then it's just going to open. There's also some stuff you don't really get, which you would get much easier with web model and collaborative stuff. So looking into the future from our perspective from Camunda, so what we are going to do, um, after we leverage um, all the, those technologies to build the standalone offline model, the next step, what we're going to do is we're actually also building a simple solution for people to col collaborate on BPMN, CMMN, and DMN diagrams. So that's something to look forward to us in the future. There's no deadlines, and uh, we don't know what the XX feature set is, but uh, the idea is, again, making collaboration about the, the diagrams with those standards, make that as painless as possible. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Nico. Yeah, so um, once again, there's, there's uh, much more coming up, and I think it's, it's quite thrilling, actually, to follow this. Okay. Right. So um, now we should talk a bit about execution. And um, we have the matter of so-called process instance migration. Let me quickly fill you in what this is about. Most of you are probably familiar with that already, at least if you have some experience in process automation. So um, the challenge is as following. Sometimes we define a process model. We put that into production. People start working with it. There's process instances um, um, pending in that process model. For example, here we have six process instances altogether, one, 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 and then three make six. And um, therefore, um, and we have a situation here. Let's now assume that we change the process model um, from version 1 to version 2, for example, removing a step, like a step called um, second step C. Now we put that version into production. For obvious reasons, the default behavior of any decent BPMN engine is that process instances that have been started in version 1 will be completed in version 1. So that's built-in versioning. However, um, quite often, of course, you want to kind of hotfix the running process instances. You want a process instance that has been started in version 1 to be continued in version 2 right away. So what can you do about it? Um, and, and this is where the new process instance migration feature kicks in. So um, I would say rather than talking too much about it, let me quickly demo it. Before I do that, uh, let me quickly point out um, what is open source about that and, and what not, because not everything is open source in this case. Um, as you can see here, in the core, we have obviously the core engine. So we have implemented some stuff that helps you migrating process instances in the engine. That's open source. It's exposed using the Java API. So you can consume the Java API in your own application. That's also open source. You can also consume the REST API that sits on top of the Java API in your own application um, or your user interface, whatever. That's also open source. However, if you want to use Cockpit out of the box, 
for process instance migration. And there are some quite fancy features that I'm going to show that leverage the open source REST API. That part of Cockpit is not open source, so therefore um, that's one more reason to, to go for the enterprise edition, obviously. Okay, pointing that out, let me sh quickly show you what, what this is about and how it works. So, um, I've mentioned the problem already. So let's look at a cockpit, at the current situation in cockpit regarding the migration example. Um, here we have on the left-hand side certain versions. And I think it was version, uh, I've played a lot with that. Version 29, we have already um, and created some process instances um, earlier today. So there we can see, all right, um, this is the situation for version 29 of this process model. So now we want to change this model, deploy the changed version, and um, yeah, get those instances on the newest version. So first I'm going to change it. So very quickly, oops, calling it to my good old Eclipse double-clicking on this diagram, directly opens it in the Kimono Modeler. Um, I just delete it, boop. Okay, so there we go. And now um, I save it, and yeah, now I have a new version, obviously. I quickly deploy that. It's gonna be, as I said, deployed as a new version in default. That's what, what's happening here right now. Okay, I check cockpit to see if that new version is, is there. Dip, 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 dip. Ooh, there we are, migration example, there we go. You can see version 32 now, uh, looks different. That's a step missing. Okay, now I want to bring the process instances of version 28, I believe. Um, no, it was 29. Okay, um, we want to bring those instances to the newest version. So um, there's a new area in Cockpit called Migration. Um, I can click on that link, but I can also click on that arrow that will directly assume that I want to migrate to the latest version. So therefore, I click on that. And what we can see now is a pretty fancy feature, really. Um, it shows us that on the left-hand side, the version 29 um, has those, those um, six instances pending, like one in each step um, on top and three in the step, second step C. And it's easy to migrate um, um, those, those um, upper steps um, since, you know, they still exist in the newest version of the diagram. And just by the way, I can quickly, um, I, can, I can freely choose the version I want to migrate to so I can even migrate back to an old version if I want to. Um, so so that, that's easy. But how about this step, second step C? What I can do now is I can um, create a mapping plan that tells Kamunda, okay, please, you know, map the instances that are currently pending in second step C to some other step. You know? So for example, to, to back to the first step so that the user will then you know, make that decision once again. Um, that could be a reasonable decision. Um, all right, so now we have created a migration plan. So what we can do now is, and you know, it's a pretty cool feature, isn't it? So now I um, need to select some, some instances. So what I will do now is um, I will say which instances should actually be migrated based on that mapping plan. Could be just, you know, a particular instance or, or some. Could also be all instances um, on a certain page. You know, if we have hundreds of thousands of instances, we would, of course, have pagination here, so therefore this wouldn't apply anymore. That's where the filter kicks in. So I can define a filter on all kinds of criteria, for example, certain payload values, and then say, okay, all um, instances that apply to the, that filter will be migrated. Okay, this is easy now because I just pick those and say, okay, I want to migrate this. Now that comes the good old you're playing with fire um, warning, and it also tells me what is going to happen, and it allows me to yeah, just define certain details. So for example, if I have, as I mentioned, hundreds of thousands of instances, I probably want to um, let that you know, be done in a batch as synchronously so they don't you know, sit in front of a frozen web window or web browser window. Um, if it's just a few, I can tick that off. I will tick it on for now because um, now I just execute that, it tells me, okay, now there's a batch, it's gonna happen, so I can observe the progress, and okay, for those um, six instances, that was easy busy, so we're done already. Um, and yeah, let's check out the result. So we can see now migration example is in version 32, six instances pending there, um, and the three that have been in second step C are now in the first step together with that one that was in the first step already. <sighs> right, <laughs> that's about it. Um, 
as you can imagine, we're quite excited about it. Um, it's one of those features that were totally driven by customer demand. I think um, and, 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 and all involved, not only Daniel and Niku, but, but all the other um, um, developers um, have, have done an outstanding job here. Um, just, just by the way, to let you know, there's BPMN.io in here once again. We're not modeling here, but we're displaying BPMN. You know, we are able to pick to click on symbols, their annotations like, like the number there, all that is based on those um, and, and, and awesome libraries that you can get with BPMNIO and leverage yourself, or BPMNJS as it's, as it's called. All right, um, good. So much about the process instance migration. Um, then whenever I miss something important, you just kick in and say that. You know, uh, Okay, good. Yeah, I, I have something. You, you refer to the code in the process engine as um, some stuff in, in, in the back end. And um, that's actually a lot of stuff. And it's pretty cool that, that because when we started on this, um, we were not really sure whether this would be possible at all. Um, because while well, BPMN, I mean, the, the examples we had now, they, they look pretty simple and pretty easy. And that's the beauty about BPMN. But BPMN can also get pretty damn complex if you use like all the elements, compensation, and all that stuff. And um, the guys working this, they were always like, oh, I'm not sure whether this is at all possible. But then in the end, when they made it, they, they were really happy that that um, that it even works for like the complex cases and everything. So yeah, that's we're pretty excited about this. Just wanted to yeah give some credit to. Yeah, thanks for that. That's of course that, that's that's very well deserved and important. You know, when someone shows it off like like myself, we only look of course at the surface, but um, we're not aware of what has actually happened under the hood, and there's happened a lot. So, um, absolutely right. <laughs> okay, um, let's look at multi-tenancy and um, just quickly recap um, 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 what, what it's about. Let's assume you're a software as a service vendor. You have some, some, some awesome cloud offering, which is, for example, about you know, how to process invoices in a very convenient fashion. So you may want to leverage a process engine like Camunda in order to um, make that available. So you embed Camunda um, in your offering, and then, of course, you sign up customers, like hundreds of customers, of course, and therefore you have many, um, as we call it, or SaaS providers call it tenants. So um, there are certain things then that you want to make sure about. Um, um, foremost, make sure that customer A won't see the stuff that belongs to customer B, for example. <laughs> let it be process models, let it be process instances, tasks, um, decision tables, um, decision executions, stuff like that. So this is what we have um, improved. It was there already. We already have a pattern for that, which is basically a um, one engine instance per tenant pattern. But since so many software vendors um, um, are using Camunda now, um, we were confronted with the, with the fact that some of them have in fact, hundreds, sometimes even thousands of customers. So um, the one engine and one database schema per tenant pattern was not always um, the most convenient option. So therefore, we have um, added um, another pattern, which is about um, a specific column in a database table that simply um, um, says, OK, a certain, for example, process definition belongs to a certain tenant. Again, this looks very simple. In fact, there um, was a lot of complexity that needed to be um, um, solved, not only for process definitions, but for all those other kind of resources like process instances, tasks, decisions, cases, whatnot. And it has not only happened on the database level. So um, you, you, you may find similar um, solutions um, with, with other products, um, but we have gone far beyond that. So um, we have quite a lot of stuff that leverages um, um, those additions to the database schema, for example, to um, create tenant-specific authorizations um, and do that um, even on the UI level to make it way more convenient and easier um, for a software vendor to, to leverage that, that tenant market approach. So um, I would say um, let's look at it very quickly um, in the live demo. There's not so much to show here because much is happening under the hood. But um, just let you know about the general use cases. So for example, maybe you want to provide you know, one process like a BPMN diagram for all your tenants, the same, the same process model. But then, of course, the process instances will be separated. So tenant customer A has their own process instances based on the same process model like customer B. Maybe you also want to separate the process models or case models or decision tables right away. You can do that, of course, as well. What we have seen quite often um, in real world is, yeah, let's call it hybrid approaches. So for example, you have one general 
process definition for all your tenants, but then you'll separate um, certain elements, for example, a sub-process that may be tenant-specific or decision tables that may be tenant-specific. So um, and there's, there's many, many use cases for that pattern as well, and all that is possible in a very convenient way. Um, very quickly, um, looking at the time, um, not showing everything, but very quickly, as you can see here now in Camunda admin, um, for example, there's now an area called tenant, and here I can define tenants. I can say that a tenant, um, or that, that certain user groups, for example, may belong to a tenant, or single users may belong to a tenant, like this uh, very charming Hans Wolf guy here, um, and <laughs> sorry about that, and others. So um, we, have, we have this um, regarding the users and how they are related to tenants. We have authorizations, like how certain you know, resources are related um, um, to tenants, and so on and so forth. But all like, like already, we have um, one situation, for example, when looking at cockpit, we have process definitions that um, are global, so all tenants can, can see and use them, for example, and we have other process definitions here that are tenant-specific, like one is only for customer one, and the other one is only for customer two. And this means that, for example, that only users who belong to that tenant can, for example, start processes based on that model or can work on tasks based on process instances based on that model. So um, just very quickly, let's assume my Hans Wurst user is actually the administrator of that specific tenant or customer, so he should be allowed to log into cockpit. But if he does, he should not be able to see all process definitions, and he doesn't. He does not see the process definition that belongs to tenant number two, but only the one that belongs to his own tenant, as well as the process definitions that are global anyway. Yeah, as you can imagine, there's much more about that, but I also know that not all of you um, are working with, with software vendors, so therefore I would like to um, let it rest for now. But um, I will run a quick poll at the end of this webinar, and if you're interested in this, uh, we can set up a dedicated webinar that is um, specifically about how to leverage multi-tenancy. Okay. So, not much left, really. So let's look at, um, very quickly, the matter of reporting. and. In a nutshell, this is about business activity monitoring. And as you know, of course, um, this is quite an important part. Um, we have always said and we still believe that, that at a certain point it makes sense to simply get the data, the, 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 the KPI out of cockpit. There's many ways to do that or out of Camunda. Very ways to do that um, and just, you know, um, leverage that in the business intelligence and the BI tool that, that, you, that you like most. That's probably the best idea if you really want to look at your KPI in a very sophisticated fashion. However, there's also at least simple ways to look at KPI um, and come under out of the box right away. So what we have done now is we have um, um, extended the REST API, so we have implemented a first report that is available um, via the API directly. So you can just, you know, check it out on the docs, and then you can just get those KPI data about so-called duration, like, you know, process instance cycle time. It's also sometimes called, so how long did it take process to complete on average, for example. And you can get that data using the REST API right away in a very efficient way. But you can also look at cockpit that obviously leverages that, that API extension now. So when looking at cockpit, in the report section, there's right now only this one report. Um, and as you can see here, um, we can look at, okay, what has happened so far for all process definitions, or maybe just for the invoice example. Um, we can look at the invoice example at a specific version of the process or spanning over all versions. We might be interested in not only quarterly, but monthly. Um, how long did it take on average to complete that process? Like in this example, seven and a half days more or less. Um, at max, it was about 14 um, and days, and minimum was 22 hours. Um, so we have that information here now. We have it in a graphical way, in a table way. We can export the stuff as CSV for Excel or as a JSON file. So it doesn't look too much like rocket science, but I think it solves an everyday problem in a very, very convenient way, and that's the rocket science behind it. So um, therefore, um, um, it's, it's a very, very interesting, from my point of view, um, not only solution right away, but of course also it shows what's possible with Camunda. This here is a Cockpit plugin, so Cockpit has that plugin architecture, so you can easily create your own reports, hook them into Cockpit, or you can wait for us to create more reports and deliver them with the next versions of Camunda BPM. So, um, so much about BAM, and, oh, oh BAM, and now we can, um, 
look at the last um, um, chapter, which is about external tasks. And this is important enough to spend a bit of time on it. So what is it about? Um, it's a feature, a pattern that um, the developers have implemented for 7.4 already. And back then, I didn't really realize what, what the value was. So I mentioned it in the release webinar, but was not even like familiar or aware of the value behind it. And then I have seen an incredible adoption and an incredible interest in that pattern once the community and the customers have understood it. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a real, you know, developer-driven innovation of a product, um, um, which, is, which is a great thing to experience, of course. So um, what, we, what we see here is um, a situation where a media company um, wants to orchestrate services that are long-running. So um, um, here we have, for example, large video files that need to be transcoded or you know, converted or whatever. This can take hours. Um, normally, what you would do um, with a service task as a process engine is, let me quickly get this kind of laser pointer here. So normally, um, the process engine, like, like, like in this example, would actively call a service, like a REST API service, would actively call it, say, here's work to do, service would do the work, when it's done, the engine continues. However, that can cause problems. For example, if the service is very long running, you know, then you have, of course, a problem when you interact with it synchronously. You can interact with it asynchronously, you know, implementing a callback on the service side, implementing correlation on the engine side. But what if we could actually implement this pattern here, which is similar to how you can handle user tasks technically in, in Camunda. So the engine arrives at the service task, but then says, okay, here's work to do. I will do nothing right now. I will simply store it, like in a queue in a way. And if the service calls me, asks for work, I will present that work. The service can do the work and then let me know that um, it's, it's done and I can com complete or continue. Sounds simple, but there's quite some stuff that needed to be implemented under the hood, um, firstly, and secondly, it's extremely interesting in, um, in terms of the advantages that come with it. So for example, we have a built-in temporal decoupling using this pattern. We don't really need a JMS, for example, anymore, like a message queue, because it's in there already. We have a way easier um, approach for polyglot architectures. You know, it's way easier to implement some client logic um, in .NET that, that calls the engine, that, that calls the engine. That's easier than creating an API that you need to put on top of your .NET um, service, for example. And um, as you can imagine, we've already created, like the client logic is really just a few lines of code in most cases. So we have created that already as examples for different languages, including .NET. So it's just there. It's really not, not much to do here in order to leverage that. So that's, of course, better than if you want to have hybrid architectures with different languages. It's easier to scale. It's easier to scale um, by starting or stopping um, 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 those workers, you know, that, 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 that um, 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 encapsulate the service, basically. So therefore, it's easier to say, okay, I just start up more workers because I expect more load or I want to be able to process more load, and they call then the engine. That's better, better rather than let the engine call it and, you know, take care of, on, um, of load balancing on, on, on your end, um, which, of course, can be very complex. Um, it's way easier if you have a hybrid architecture in terms of um, 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 cloud and on-premise um, um, interaction. So let's assume, you know, Camunda runs on Amazon Web Services, which happens quite a lot these days, um, and, but, but you have some legacy application behind a firewall, you know, in your data center. Then, of course, it's way easier to let um, your, your, your worker, your service call Camunda on AWS and ask for work rather than let Camunda call your on-premise that sits behind the firewall, which can cause, of course, you know, security concerns and stuff like that. Um, and, of course, as I mentioned, um, it's easier to implement it um, in order to avoid timeouts if you have long-running services. So, you know, it's one of those things that are so obvious once, once you're aware of it, um, um, but yeah, we didn't think about it, or I didn't think about it because before it was there. And I'm quite sure that you won't find it with maybe all other vendors um, um, right now. Maybe I'm wrong, of course. I don't know that. Um, all right, quite interesting. Quite some stuff behind it. Um, quite some improvements that have happened because it was um, so... Um, so popular or has become so popular. So um, the guys have implemented, you know, um, some support, for example, um, if you have a, 
um, external task um, um, and pattern implemented and you want to leverage the boundary event. So that was not yet possible with um, 7.4 and now it's possible. So you can do things like this here, for example, um, so that you can react if there's exceptions that happened in your external um, um, task or worker. Um, so um, very interesting customer-driven real innovation that is, you know, off the beaten track of what you will find where the, let me say that BS uh, bingo marketing um, stuff, sometimes out there in the VPN space. Okay, um, yes, we are, we're done for now. There's one last remark I want to make before um, I will ask the guys if there's any questions. Um, firstly, I want to make sure, Daniel, if I missed anything, um, you, can, you can stop in and, and, and let me know. Okay, I didn't. <laughs> right, so it was me talking all the time. But okay, the good news is that I didn't mess it up. <laughs> um, Okay, um, besides that, just one tip. Um, um, in the mid-September mid in, in Berlin, in Germany, there's the Community Day. So um, when you follow that link, you'll already find um, the structure of the agenda. We're currently putting it together, so there's a lot of to be confirmed um, on the agenda right now, but we're working on it. And um, it's free. You can just, um, you know, swing by um, in our office. Um, spend the day with us or half day so we will start at noon and then we will go out for dinner together they know us from Camundo so <laughs> at least that is a good reason to attend of course <laughs> and also um, there's, there's more good reasons for example you will find um, a lots of information first hand from our consultants about best practices and what other users um, experience with Camundo you can meet those users of course um, you will get insights um, into the further roadmap um, and development you will meet um, all those other users and, and, and be able to network with them you will also also meet the Camundo core developers like Daniel and Nico and all those, they're all here and, and happy to answer all questions and that you might have and happy to um, appreciate your feedback and, and um, look at your ideas and suggestions for the future. Um, yeah, so, so uh, we do that every year and we enjoy ourselves a lot, our attendees do as well. Um, so um, um, I would say, um, yeah, don't miss it and um, would love to welcome you here in Berlin, of course. Okay, so. Um, that's about it for now. Um, thanks for attending. Um, I'm looking to Nico and Daniel now if there um, are any questions left that we should cover. Now we're good for now. Okay, very quickly. I stopped the screen sharing. So then there's one last thing I want to um, do. Before, before I close the session, um, I've told you about many different things. So um, I'm interested in learning what is most interesting for you because based on that, we will um, um, and conduct follow-up webinars that you know um, will focus on certain elements and come as kind of tutorials that will help you um, um, start with the stuff um, right away. So um, this is um, a little poll that we're running right now. Of course, we will not you know, conduct only one webinar. I know that you might be interested in element templates as well as multi-tenancy, but still it would be great if you could just let us know what would be most interesting for you if you had to pick one. Um, and we will, as I say, um, most um, probably we will conduct a webinar for each of those topics, but it will help us shaping the priorities um, um, which to conduct first and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Thanks a lot for the feedback that we're getting right now about those topics, and I think you can follow that as well. So, um, looks like CMN is currently <laughs> in the lead. Interesting. Element templates also quite interesting for the people. All right, yeah. Well, that looks pretty good. Cool. So, while you're voting, um, I would already say thanks a lot. All questions have been answered, super. And um, yeah, would love to welcome you in Berlin, as I said. Would love to see you using our, our technology. Um, would love to work with you. So if you're interested in conducting a proof of concept, for example, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we have helped um, um, our customers to evaluate Camunder um, in a very hands-on way. So um, happy to help you here as well, of course. And um, yeah, hope to see you back um, maybe in the next week's webinar or at some other occasion. Um, as I mentioned, you will get the slides afterwards. You will get the recording afterwards. Um, Please bear with us for a few days. Um, we need to you know, prepare the whole material and then send it out to you. Thanks to you guys. I think we're done for today. So goodbye from my end already. And Yes, thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye-bye.